Hello, everyone, and welcome back. Uh, happy Monday, and welcome to our 14th episode of the Invisible Museum Tour. We took a break over the summer uh, and are happy to return with what promises to be an incredibly revealing episode that I'm sure is going to fascinate and amaze you. My name is Jeff Olson. I'm the Art Education Director for Royal Talents North America. Today's show is sponsored by Royal Talents and the Z Academy, and thank you to both for their support. At the end of today's broadcast, we're going to pick a name from the comments, so make sure you put in a comment or a question, and we are going to award a set of Rembrandt oil paints to the winner, so stay tuned to the end, and we'll announce the winner then. Uh, and now, of course, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you our esteemed museum guide. She is an award-winning artist whose work is featured in numerous prominent private and public collections around the world. She is an art historian and educator working for over a decade at the Getty Museum in Los Angeles. She is the co-founder of the nonprofit Project Awe, on mission, a mission dedicated to exploring connections between Western esotericism and the arts. And she is also the founder of the Z Academy, where she mentors students of all ages. Everyone join me in welcoming back the remarkable Zenia Gertschman. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello, Jeff. Hello from Los Angeles. Hello, everyone. Tell us where you are. We love to hear all the places that you're tuning in from. And even later, if you're watching us in recording, type in your questions and comments. Uh, we will try to answer. I will make sure I answer during our time together in the next hour, the next hour of our journey. But also afterwards, I'll tune in and I'll, I'll look at all your comments. I try to follow up diligently. So today I'm particularly excited because it is our 14th episode and I share with you my all my original research. I had to wait till it was published so that I can speak about it publicly and you are the first audience to find out about the secret gesture that I discovered in the work of the greatest master of all times, Albrecht Dürer. So I'm going to start my PowerPoint. So hang on a second. Let's start our beautiful images from beginning from beginning okay and i just need to move this little square out of the way okay so um the secret gesture so first of all i wanted to talk to you about why gesture uh, basically the visual arts are based on a sign language. We read the paintings without words. We read the paintings, even as I'm talking to you, I'm gesticulating, I'm throwing my arms in the air, trying to help myself. And think of this in the time of Albrecht Dürer in 1500s, the visual language was at its height. And if you were really trained to read it, you could understand two types of meaning. There was always an overt meaning that is available to a larger audience. And there would be in the same gesture, uh, a hidden layer that would be talking to a smaller audience directly, uh, directed di uh, to the minds that are supposed to be active and understanding, perhaps even passing the censorship, the censorship of uh, the court or the church or, or persecution that could come with uh, speaking the truth. And um, I want you to think it's almost like the sophisticated emoji or memes. Uh, sometimes when I look at my daughter, Nika, uh, she's 14. Some of the memes that she shows me from today, I don't know if you feel like that, Jeff, with your kids, but I don't yeah. understand what they're talking about, right? I have not been trained in this teen language. So this is similar where we can be looking at the portrait. We can look at Mona Lisa. We can look at uh, uh, Dürer's self-portrait, which I'm going to show you next. This is just a detail. So this is uh, one of the most famous self-portraits, probably the most sal uh, famous self-portraits in history of art. And we can know it. We can even have a magnet on refrigerator and send it as a postcard to a friend, but we may miss the gesture and what it means. And no longer today, we're going to follow on a journey of this hand. And uh, the one thing that I wanted to tell you, what's curious about this portrait and which is known, and of course we've even visited, we did a couple of lectures on Dura in the series, um, that this is a portrait made in the style of Salvatore Mundi, the savior of the world or Christ. So I want to show you, uh, what a typical portrait of Christ would look like. So here we look at a gorgeous memling from 1478, just a few years before Dürer's painting is painted, and we put them side by side. Dürer is posing, basically 
as Christ in this image. So you could notice that the frontality is very special. You know, it's not a three quarter portrait. He's addressing the viewer directly. The dark background, it's very telling. Uh, the pale skin framed by the darker hair. And of course the gesture, although the gestures vary and we will find out how. And um, uh, this is painted, what's very important, Durer's painting is painted in year 1500. So what's so special? And it is pointed out in the portrait twice that it is painted in 1500. What is so special about year 1500? Ever so often in the history of the world, uh, in, in our Western European history, there were years, pivotal moments, where there was an expectation, theological expectation, that Christ will return, Christ will come back. Um, and um, many people around the world still believe this. And it was calculated in different time periods. And at a year around 1500, they thought for sure Christ is going to be returning. So this portrait is actually in the name of Christ, in the uh, likeness of Christ. It's as if Durer is getting ready to greet him. So uh, this year is very important for us to think about it. Um, and here there's another way that Durer is presenting himself. Um, uh, it's another self-portrait within self-portrait through his famous initials, A.D., Albrecht Durer. But of course, um, it also points, and you can see that 1500 is underlined by the line of the A, 1500, so important. Um, it also stands in Latin for Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord. It's uh, BC and AD, right? This is after uh, birth of Christ. So uh, here it's a double self-portrait with thinking of Christ um, um, as how Durer can think as an artist, as a creator, um, in his understanding what Christ represents. So what's also really important to understand that Durer is not creating this work in isolation. We often think of Renaissance genius, think of Leonardo da Vinci with his secret notebooks as if uh, knowledge was just pouring out of him individually, but it was actually a large group of scholars that would come together and Durer was not alone. He belonged to an erudite group of scholars and artists and uh, uh, theologians and philosophers who were known to known today as humanists. Uh, they had um, they had placed uh, the idea of a human being and respect of to the human being as a center of their study, but also understanding religion through this new perspective. It was founded by a man whose name was Conrad Seltis. And what's important about this, that the meeting of these scholars, the meeting of this group of theologians and philosophers took place in Durer's best friend's house, uh, Perkheimer. And so Durer attended these meetings and there he was fed with ideas, the cutting edge knowledge about the philosophy and the thinking of the time. And even in this painting, we see such a reference. So do you see on the right, Jeff, um, on the left, we have his signature, right? But on the right, there's Latin text, right? Yes. I'm just going to move this a little. Okay, so uh, this says, I, Albrecht Dürer of Nuremberg, portrayed myself in the everlasting colors of uh, Rembrandt Brand at age 28 years in year 1500. So this is an inscription that he did not design. It's an inscription that was designed by Conrad Seltis, the organizer of the group to which he belonged, secretary. And for some reason, they've designed this text to go in and Dura paints it in. So this is an evidence of an idea that is fed to him that directly finds in his work of art. Here, it's not so important, or perhaps it's just uh, less important as what you'll see in a moment. The importance of this is just to underline that the year 1500 again is a very a telling time. But uh, the most important that in the circle of friends of these incredible colleagues, there was a concept of Christian Kabbalah discussed and that informed the thinking the most. So Christian Kabbalah, that's a mouthful. So I want to unpack a little bit what that means. So Kabbalah in 
uh, the Jewish tradition is the study of the mystical aspect of religion. So this is coming from uh, Judaic studies, but the Christian uh, mystics of 13th century became very interested in understanding and in interpreting Christian religion through the mystical teaching of Jewish Kabbalah. And they combined the strange um, uh, hybrid Christian Kabbalah, which almost sounds like a contradiction. And Kabbalah literally means reception, reception of traditions, forgotten or secret knowledge that's being passed on, how to interpret the biblical texts in deeper meaning. The same way that we were talking about the gesture that, you know, this could mean hello, but also, for instance, in Roman times, if I raise my hand, that means I hear you. So it could have multiple uh, levels of meaning. So we find evidence of Christian Kabbalah directly in Dürer's work. So I'm going to show you an example. So this is designed by Ablach Dürer, also from the same year, 1500, such an important year for us, a monogram of Christ. So you see the text and the uh, Christ initials entwined, and you see a crucifixion built into this amazing design. And what's important to us that you'll see text uh, three times, the same text written in Hebrew at the top and then in Greek in the middle and at the bottom you see it in Latin. And uh, basically what you see here is um, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, uh, which was the text believed to have been attached to the top of the crucifixion. But what's important here that it's written in three languages. Why is it written in Hebrew at the top? Because it's a reference by Durer that the Torah or Jewish Bible came first. It was then translated to Greek, so we have a Greek translation, and lastly was translated to the Latin to the uh, uh, Latin speaking population in Latin. So we have it third and lower, and the Hebrew text is put above as the original originating the idea. What's amazing about it that the Hebrew letters, as you look at it here, is spelled so perfectly that it is compelling to believe that. Uh, um, Dura is not simply copying the text, but is fluent in Hebrew and can write beautifully and eloquently. But what's even more interesting is how the name of Jesus is uh, written here. So you could see uh, Jesus is on the left at the bottom uh, in Latin. Of course, on uh, in Hebrew, it's going to be on the right because it's written from right to left. So this is the word Yeshua or Jesus. Um, and we see a little bit closer. Here we go. And in order to understand the significance of how the name is written, I show you uh, a very sacred word, uh, which in the um, Jewish tradition thought to be unpronounceable. It's a full letter name of God. You see the Jewish letters transliterated at the bottom, Yud, Hey, Waf, Hey. Um, and it's supposed to be such a powerful name of God. Uh, it's considered a, a, a four letter name that um, if you pronounce it, if you were to pronounce it, you could almost destroy the world. That it's so powerful, it's, it's imbued with the powers of God. And there was a man, an amazing uh, a man whose name is Roiklin, who was a great uh, Christian Kabbalist and was one of the best friends of Durer's best friend. Uh, and uh, Durer's best friend supported his work and had his work uh, translated and added to his library. And uh, uh, Roiklin championed an idea that if you take this old, uh, amazing, powerful four-letter word and insert one letter, one Jewish letter to it, it will transform into a wonder-working word. And that's what I'm going to show you. So here we see Johann Roiklin in his text, De Verbe Mirifico, the wonder-working word. So the same four letters, can you see them, Jeff? The same four letters, we see them in Durer. This is from Durer's print. If you slice them in the middle, and drop one letter in between, we get a new word. And it's the wonder working word. And the letter we dropped, it looks like a W, but in Hebrew, it's a letter Shin. And it allows you from the unpronounceable, ineffable, magical idea of God's name to be able to pronounce it. We now can say it, and it spells Yoshua or Jesus. 
So this is a way for, by Christian Kabbalists to show the continuation of tradition and how God can reveal himself if he is in, uh, um, uh, invisible in the Jewish tradition. You cannot look directly straight at God. Through Christianity, through birth of Christ, through adding of this letter Shin, all of, all of a sudden God becomes visible. And here we see it again, um, an amazing uh, print looking from the far um, and how it is written. So Christ is crucified, as I mentioned to you, in the uh, Christogram or his initials, a monogram. Traditionally, a monogram of Christ would be taken in Latin letters based on his Greek name. So typically you'll see various designs of um, putting JHS in various configurations. Can you tell uh, Jeff the, um, you have actually, a, not A, uh, but I, uh, that I and J are interchangeable in Latin. Joshua or Jesus, here is the I. Here we have H and S, so Christus, Joshua Christus, right? Yes. yes Can you yes, make yes. those letters? So what's really interesting, uh, in Juris version, there's a strange configuration. There is this letter that makes no sense, right? There's an addition to the left of the crucifixion uh, that we don't find anywhere else. And we wonder, why, why does it look so symmetrical? This is actually Dürer taking Reuchlin Kabbalist idea and trying to make it visible through his own work. So it's very if, similar, Genia, to the way the cross and the H create like a W. Uh, exactly you nailed it uh no pun intended uh, <laughs> it's a perfect a perfect w or shin formed and so the eye becomes in the heart of christ right in the heart in the splitting of the w or the shin letter um and so Christ again revealed within the heart of this form, and there is a reference that there is an older tradition underneath the name of Christ, right which is very fascinating to me. Really cool. So I uh, just need to bring you to speed a little bit with the uh, Jewish uh, tradition and mysticism. Uh, there is a very important name of God that is said in the daily pr prayer, um, and the name is Shaddai. Uh, basically, it, it we, the way we would translate it to English would be El Shaddai or God Al Almighty. And it again starts with a French Shin. Um, on the right side, you see the name beginning. And we find it on a protective charm, such as the mezuzah, which goes on the doorpost of Jewish homes. You may have seen uh, Jewish people always kiss the mezuzah before they enter or exit the house. Um, it is uh, the holy scroll uh, with the text of the prayer is inside. You could see the name Shaddai written with a little shin. And very, very often, uh, it is uh, distilled to just shin, you see, just the letter representing God, the power of the God, the crown of the God, uh, uh, right there on this powerful talisman. In Durer's time, uh, shin becomes a very powerful talisman, and we see it created uh, by the Kabbalists in various forms, in pendants and in texts, in books. And we find it, what I want to show you next, Forgive me for a little bit of background that I had to share with you to get us up to speed. But we do find directly Shin letter, the talismanic letter in Durer's art. And I'm about to show you something that uh, no one has seen. This is my personal discovery, uh, but it comes from the print that everyone knows. There's nobody who has not seen uh, Melancholia number one. Uh, which is made in 1514. And of course, we have seen it because it has been reproduced. It's an engraving. It is not, um, it, it lives in its reproductive quality. It's in every museum that we travel to. It's in every book, right? Um, and Jeff, uh, you probably have seen it in your travels in various museums as well. Yes, yes. So this print, known as Melancholia One, this is another journey of not a huge research that I have done that I'm happy to share. Uh, you could uh, uh, just read my article if you'd like. Um, in, if you uh, look up Melancholia and Gershman, it will come up. Uh, um, a whole research about what a journey that you could be taken without, which we're not going to do today. But um, it actually shows us that the very title, Melancholia, which is embedded into this uh, print, this sadness, this gloomy quality, 
all transforms when you understand that there is a promise of resurrection, that there is a promise that Christ will come back and that this is just a temporary moment of melancholia that can be cured and restored. And what I wanted to show you that uh, Christ is evoked many times throughout the sprint, but at the very bottom of the angel, do you see how there are nails that seem to be thrown down, four nails uh, at the bottom of uh, his skirt? Uh, you can probably guess, Jeff, what the nails allude to. The crucifixion, I'm guessing. Of course, of course. And there was a huge, actually, theological argument whether it was the three nails or the four nails that were used uh, uh, to crucify Christ. Why is this horrible uh, object of torture so important? Because it becomes a symbol of passion, uh, of suffering of Christ, which is also used as a symbol of his triumph over this torture, that he will triumph, he will resurrect. And so the very tool of uh, destruction becomes the tool of power and uh, a promise of, of healing. So look at how the nails are arranged. And there is a ruler. Can you see this ruler laying down with a little hole to hang the ruler on the wall? So um, if we look a little bit closer, here are the nails. We're going to rotate them. And then we're going to compare them to letter shin. Mm -hmm. so not only we have the form of the letter shin, but if you notice in uh, the Jewish block text, we have these beautiful serifs that uh, the letter should end in. And Adura is playing with that by putting the, the heads of the nails to form the serifs of the shin. And also shin needs a, a little dot. If you don't have that dot, the shin dot, uh, the same letter will sound, uh, will, will, be, will pro pro uh, produce an S sound. Instead of shin, it would be S, right? So uh, this letter dot, the, uh, the shin dot makes it into the sound that it makes. And look at how ingeniously he had placed the ruler that we saw with a little dot to form the pronunciation of the shin. I find this fascinating. It is fascinating. And I wonder if uh, our viewers are commenting yet or sending any questions. Let me know and please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, here I wanted to show you a, a cross section of the heart depicting its chambers. And it's very curious that the letter um, fits beautifully within the heart's design. And whether it is uh, a coincidence or not, uh, it has not escaped the eye of the Kabbalists. And I wanted to share something with you, um, a, a print from a book by Jacob Baum, which was the, uh, considered, uh, Baum is considered uh, one of the first German great philosophers and uh, uh, mystics. And uh, in his text, he has designed everything we've talked about. Uh, here is the name of Christ, Joshua with the four letter Jewish powerful name of God with Shin inserted to create Yoshua, the name of Christ, but it is framed by the blazing heart. So Shin is played, placed into the blazing heart and uh, in order to make sure that the uh, Latin audience understand, here we have Christ in a larger circle. Do you see the C-H-R-I-S-T? Christus, right? So the yeah. name of Christ in Latin to make sure that all of these ideas are brought together. So this is not something that uh, is escaping the erudite mind. And uh, Baum in this book uh, writes about this symbol that he has created. And he talks about it as, as if it's a book inside our hearts. And I just wanted to share his quote. For we men have one book in common, which points to God. And he's not talking about the Bible. He says, each has within himself, which is the priceless name of God. So you do not need to see the name of God in the biblical or religious text. It is inside you. Its letters are the flames of his love, which he out of his heart in the priceless name of Jesus revealed in us. What does it mean in his heart, in the priceless names of Jesus revealed? That's the wonder working uh, word, right? In the heart of the four letter Jewish name of God, adding the shin. Read these letters in your hearts and spirits and you have books enough. 
all the writings of the children of God direct you unto that one book within yourself. And therein lie all the treasures of wisdom. This book is Christ in you. So very interesting. You could see why you would want to hide this knowledge because you could see how the, uh, the church might not very much like this, right? If you're taking away the Bible, you're taking away the church and saying, you don't need any other text. You don't need a priest. You could just look inside your heart and God is within you, right? The spirit of the Reformation, right? Exactly. So here we have uh, a going back to the portrait of Durer, and I believe that this exact quote, uh, uh, the concept of this quote is what we find here, that Durer, look at the gesture, he only shows you one hand. This hand is framed with dramatic chiaroscuro, the light in the dark, it's really glowing. Its finger, its index finger, like an arrow, takes you directly to his heart. And when we look closer at the hand, it is presented in a very interesting pattern. I dare everybody who's watching this to try to do this gesture. You have to separate your index finger and your pinky while keeping the uh, two middle fingers together. The middle and the ring finger has to be bound. And then you have to curve and create this this. Uh, this expression, right, with separating the other two fingers. It is not easy. Your hand will not do this naturally. You have to consciously work on that symbol. And I believe what we're seeing here is the representation of letter Shin or, or W, right, if we were to describe it in Latin terms, but Shin with the hand. And we already thought, and so has Shin uh, evokes the idea of heart and Christ within. And this is exactly what I think Dura is trying to do here. And from now on, we will refer to this gesture as Shin gesture. There's a request, uh, Jenya, to look back at that image of the heart, um, just so they can see that again. I think the, yeah, so that one, and maybe the one before too, that showed the diagram of the heart. There we go. And so it's the cross section pieces, right, that are, uh, so right at the bottom, if you look at the bottom, the shin fits the bottom part, there and we... then it's three points, the W spreads and separating the vessels right in the chambers of the heart and fits right into its shape. So uh, if you think of the heart shape and we go to the next slide, uh, the shin is at the bottom again with the, you see, with the shape of the upside down heart. Thank you. For if we go back and forth, we could see the similarity. Right. So it's as if if you looked at, at the upside down heart, the bottom of it would make a W if you add another uh, division in the middle. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's how it fits so beautifully. Now, this we could spend hours looking at. Uh, I did not mention that there are secret letters uh, woven into the flames right around here. Can you see that there's little letters that are hidden that you could start making? Oh, yeah. Out? yeah. Right. Yeah. It is. It's it's a, so, yeah. yeah. Exactly, it has so many layers of meaning that's supposed to be, uh, again, like within your heart, come forward. Um, didn't intend to tell it, but since we went back, um, it says uh, El, and at the uh, top, Yesusi and Emmanuel. So Emmanuel is an, another name of God in uh, Hebrew. Yesus is Jesus, and El is an, uh, also a name of God, and it is continuously one becomes through these flames of love in the heart one becomes the next so you could also see how uh, perhaps uh, during the time it would be considered dangerous to ally yourself with the Jewish tradition um, and sympathize with the Jewish text um, at the time uh, the Pope had ordered uh, in Rome to burn all Jewish texts. And Reuchlin, the man who came up with a magic working word, uh, was the one who spoke against it and put his life on the line by saying, I'd rather die than allow you to burn Jewish texts and did amazing brave speeches as a Christian man, right? Not as a Jewish man saying that this is holy, this is uh, fascinating, this is our heritage, we need to preserve it. So a very, very interesting tradition. Okay. There was a question, Jenny, about this image. Is there, does Durer try to place the dot uh, in this 
uh, portrait, do you think, somewhere? If you, we can look for it and we can maybe discover some things together, but um, you will see something very interesting in just a moment, uh, how, how the shin gets incorporated. So if you hold that thought and we can come back and search yep. together, uh, but shin gets abstracted even without the dot um, into this gesture. So we'll come back, but hold it for one second because it'll become very interesting. Uh, here you can actually see 15 years later, the man of sorrows. This is Christ who we see doing just fine, even though he has stigmatus in his hand, uh, the uh, holes in his hand from the nails where he was crucified. And you could see mind of a matter that he has resurrected and he's showing us the objects of passion or torture. And he is uh, has come back to fulfill his promise to protect the men. And the two hands with the stigmatus are forming what? Can you see it? Yeah. You see the shin pointing mm -hmm. to the heart and down below. So this is another esoteric idea or mystic idea. When you point above towards the heaven and you point below towards the men, God and men, as above, so below, his hands showing the unity between God and men, and both are forming shin. There is to remind you. And here we literally have the hole or the dot of shin with the stigmata from the nails that we saw in melancholia. Uh, these are the names of the artists that you will find, and it go, the list can go on for a very long time, that use the shin gesture. You'll find it in some of the greatest men, Van der Weyden, Raphael, Titian, Michelangelo, Pantormo, some of my favorite artists, Caravaggio, a wonderful artist, uh, Sofanisba Anisola, uh, who's a female artist that we dedicated a lecture to, Velasquez. Again, the list can go on for hours. You will find Shin gesture. So largely it has been overlooked and mm -hmm. there's very little scholarship on it, although it has been noticed. And it, um, it has been particularly noticed because El Greco uh, was the artist um, that used it repeatedly in his works of art. And because he used it in repeatedly, um, there is a scholarship that um, it was said that he's using this gesture. Here we see it twice in this incredible uh, a painting. We see it in Christ pointing to his heart, and we see Mary Magdalene placing it on the shoulder of Mary. Um, and it was termed as pseudo, help me pronounce this, Jeff. <laughs> pseudo uh, zygodactius. Gesture. Yeah. Not so good yeah. for me not being able to pronounce with two doctors in my family, my parents, uh, <laughs> but it has been termed as a medical term that this is a condition, uh, basically a degenerative condition uh, at the time in Spain. Um, and that El Greco managed to show it. Now, it's such a wrong idea because we see it in all the other works of art across centuries and across uh, geographical divides. So it has nothing to do with the medical condition, but this is how you might see it talked about. It also became known because nobody can pronounce this name as El Greco syndrome or El Greco gesture. But here you'll notice again, it's placed so strategically None of the other characters, you know, look at them. Why does Christ and Mary Magdalene have it, but nobody else has this condition? Because they are placed strategically to point out uh, the God within the heart to the people, right? And interestingly, in this, I just want to point, um, do you notice that Christ again is being tortured? And there is a Roman soldier that's tied his hand and it's he's pulling. You see how he's pulling, trying to slide this gesture away. And Christ is straining to still keep it on his heart, right? So it seems to be the very subject of this painting. Yeah, and, and El Greco resided in Toledo and there was so much scholarship theological scholarship especially, and I'm sure he was surrounded by similar uh, spirits of, uh, of Dur, only on the other side of it, right? 100%, you, you're absolutely right again, Jeff. Um, I wanted to take you through very quickly just a few works of art that use Shin uh, 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 and incorporate, you would see this holy family, and you would see how beautifully it's painted by Agnolio Branzino, 
uh, one of, again, an amazing Italian artist. And you might be distracted by the beauty of Mary and uh, Joseph. And here we have Jesus and St. John the Baptist. And you may not notice while you're enjoying it, uh, the specific gestures, but uh, of course, the initiated would see it first. And now I'm sure for our audience, it's hard not to see it. Once you know it, you can't unsee it. And we see it twice here. St. John the Baptist uh, is placing the shin directly on Christ's heart. While Christ is asleep, it's as if he's blessing him uh, and saying that Christ is within the heart and blessing and protecting him. Like the, remember the shin on the mezuzah, on the protective doorpost, Shaddai, uh, the name of God. And then Mary places her hand on what? It looks like a book. Exactly. What kind of book? Well, I'm going to guess the Bible. Exactly. So she places the shin, the name of God, onto the Bible. So not accidental. And what's so amazing, we find it in the Vatican. Incredible. Uh, all over uh, Michel Michelangelo's uh, uh, frescoes, but specifically I wanted to show you the creation of Adam because this is probably the most famous image in the history of art. Uh, we don't even have to argue about that, right? Everybody knows the creation of Adam, been used for commercials. And, and I just turned the hands upside down to point out that two shins are exchanged. Can you see this, Jeff? Yes, yes. It's, it's interesting amazing. to see this here too. I've, I've always heard people talk of the shape of the cloak as being reminiscent of the shape of a heart, like a cross section of a heart. Incredible, incredible. And I've also heard um, it being referred to a brain as well. So some kind of an organ, right? God is this thinking, feeling organ. And then the hand, when he's creating Adam, he's not just creating Adam, but he's passing on this godly tradition onto his shin exchange, if you will, right? Uh, so what a gift that we're seeing happening in front of us. And I also wanted to point out that in uh, women's tradition, that women were part of this knowledge. And Sophonisba, uh, who we learned about, I really encourage everybody to watch our lecture episode number eight, right? Remember, Jeff, how interesting that was, yeah. the journey with her. Um, I had to hold my tongue back when I was doing that lecture because my research wasn't <laughs> published yet. Uh, but she astoundingly uses it twice in two self-portraits, in the early self-portrait and in the last self-portrait that she makes, she incorporates shin into her own hand. And you could actually see it's kind of like a hidden shin where she wraps the two middle fingers around her mole stick. The mole stick is the tool of the trade. She's securing her right hand so that the brush uh, would be precise and the hand would not wipe the painting, the wet paint underneath. So you could see here. But most importantly, when she secures her hand and she's painting, right? She's painting what? She's painting the hand of Christ. She literally touches her hand to his hand. And when we follow that hand upward, look what we see. See what Mary is doing? Yeah, both of her hands have the same configuration. We can make a verb. She's shinning, right? <laughs> <laughs> so not to be conf confused with sinning. She's shinning. She places two shins on Christ. And what I love, uh, he looks at her like a child, trusting child, and she smiles at him and makes a direct eye contact. And with her index finger, do you see what she's doing? She places it on his mouth as if to say, keep it a secret. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? It is. And then so very is intimate portrayal, I, you know, it's, it's unique. Because it's painted, of course, by a woman. So as a mother, as a, as a woman, she, she didn't have children, but as a woman who could have children, she was a woman who, um, um, uh, uh, she's, uh, oh, did she have children? I don't remember now my own lecture. But <laughs> as a woman, she has a sensitivity, right? And in her eyes, take a look at how she does a direct contact with us. If we just go back for a moment, um, uh, Look at this exchange, Mary with Christ, she touches Christ, her hand, painting hand is touched by the other hand, and then she looks at us as if like God giving Adam the shin, she gives it to the viewer. Isn't that amazing exchange? 
I don't know if it's a stretch too, but her brush and the mall create a cross. Yes, not a stretch. You are 100% right. I forgot to mention this. Uh, she creates a cross, lays a cross with what? With the tools of her trade, yeah. right? As if uh, this is in a way like saying, like Durer saying, I'm a painter in the, in the image of Christ. She says, I'm a painter and my tools form the cross of Christ, right? Yeah, yeah, inspired, and, inspired by or through. Right? Exactly, exactly. You're absolutely right. Again, no jet lag. It's not true that you jet lag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Jeff has warned me that he might be a little slow today, but he is yeah. sharp, sharp as a whistle. Uh, um, so here we have, I just wanted to point, go back to Durer for a second, and this is amazing portrayal of Virgin Mary. And of course, what is she doing in this painting? What is the act? Praying, 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 and the form of the hands. Look at how the hands are folded. Try to do this again. Try to put your, I challenge you once more to put the praying hands and then separate. Look, this is very difficult. I'm having a hard time doing this, where you keep the two fingers in the middle together, right? And separate. Can you do that, Jeff? Does it work for you? It's, it took me I a can, moment. But I've got uh, weird weird hands <laughs> mm -hmm. so let us know if you were able to do this while you're watching at when home. you put them together it's it's more challenging it's more sure. challenging not a comfortable or natural pose so. exactly so you yeah. can't write it off from uh this just folded that way that's just you know dura wasn't thinking and it just kind of folded that way and what's also interesting that here she looks outside of the painting right her gaze takes us towards god and her hands are aimed outside of this painting so this shin is a message by durer out not just to the viewer but it's a form of his own personal prayer or devotion and here is a work by his follower probably his student it has been attributed to durer and then reattributed to possibly a student um, and I thought that was important because that means that he's passing on his tradition uh, through his workshop, because once again, we have uh, the beautiful family, Mary and her mother and Christ. Mary is portrayed as a younger woman uh, uh, below, and she's praying towards her son. She's placing a shin again while he's asleep, blessing him. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. This is just a reminder of what Shin looks like. And um, as I mentioned, the scholarship on um, this gesture is very tiny, but there is one scholar that thought perhaps it comes, since it's in Spain, that we find it in um, El Greco, right, in El Greco's art. Perhaps it comes from the Sephardic Jewish tradition of the priestly blessing. And this particular gesture you might recognize from popular culture because it has been and you could see that the hands are arranged where the thumb is separated and they form the w or the shin and you have seen it once before <laughs> i couldn't resist so leonard nimoy as spock uh, is making this gesture and he tells his story himself that uh, when he was a young boy his father who was jewish took him to the temple and there was a prayer about to happen. And his father warned him, close your eyes because the priest, the Kohan priest is going to raise his hands and do a priestly blessing. And it is so powerful that his father said, it has said that God itself is going to emanate from the hands and it's too powerful, it can blind you if you look at it. And Leonard being a little boy could not resist and he peeked and he saw the gesture and it stuck with him as a, gesture of power for the rest of his life and when he was in this role uh he said to the producers to the screenwriters uh can we use as a greeting uh for this vulcan for this uh, special character a special gesture what could be better than this powerful uh gesture and as you know uh it comes with a saying do you remember the saying live long and prosper that's right so directly from the kohan uh priests here but what i want to point to you that that again was uh, though it forms shin 
uh, it forms shin in a different pattern. It uses the thumb. In an inner gesture, the thumb is inactive, and it's the digits itself that make the shin gesture by binding the two middle fingers. Here, they're separated, right? So this has a different origin. And I have to thank Pinhas Giller, who is the director of Jewish studies, and hopefully he's watching today or later this presentation. Uh, he's head of Jewish studies at American Jewish University, uh, a really esteemed scholar. I um, uh, really encourage you to read his books on Kabbalah if you're interested. Uh, um, he hel uh, helped me with this project and encouraged me. And together we identified that the source for this gesture comes not from the uh, priestly blessing, but from tefillin. And so what is tefillin? These are two leather boxes uh, that have leather straps attached to them. They're known also in Greek term phylacteries, which is, means protectant, uh, another form of protection. And inside these boxes, there are scrolls of uh, coming from the Torah or the Jewish uh, holy text. And they're used in the prayer uh, in the morning and attached to the body of uh, the Orthodox uh, Jewish men. And uh, it comes directly from the commandment from the Bible. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Very interesting uh, that we have a mention of the heart. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. So I wanted to show you a painting by Chagall. <laughs> a little bit of uh, time forward. Uh, Chagall is dear to me because I saw him growing up. Uh, his paintings were very important to me and inspired my own work. And his early roots were in a small uh, village in Vitebsk, and he painted his rabbi. And here you could see that fill-in attached to the head and wrapped down the arm, you see? It comes down the arm. So I just wanted to show you what it would look like when it's worn. And uh, when fill-in is wrapped uh, all the way through down the arm, it has to form the letter shin on the hand. Do you see it? And then the two middle fingers are, in the Sephardic tradition, they're actually bound together. So here, in a way, the hand itself does the gesture that we've seen in Durer's work and other paintings. So here's what letter shin looks like as a reminder. And here is the bound hand of Christ by the rope. Aha! I hope you're very excited like me. Very much so. This is wonderful. Any comments, any questions from our viewers as we go on? We're going to wrap up with some Everybody real amazing just, surprise. Uh, struck. I, I think uh, uh, there's lots of revelations going on. Things that we've looked at and taken for granted uh, are becoming really clear. And, and with Durer, it's no surprise, right? He has so much symbolic imagery in his works, especially his prints, but uh, not a surprise to see them in this painting. Right. And uh, now I'm going to show you a little Durer surprise because we find that the wrapping at Philin becomes actually the subject of his painting. Ooh. So this yeah. painting you might have seen uh, called Christ Among the Doctors. It's a very interesting subject taken from the Gospel of St. Luke. Uh, I don't know if you remember the story. Our viewers remember the story, but Christ went missing and he was 12 years old. And if you have a 12 year old or a teenager at home, if your son has gone or your child has gone missing for three days, you'd be very worried. And when he is discovered, he's discovered in the shul, in the synagogue, and he is busy. He was so busy uh, learning and uh, even teaching to the old man, wise men. Um, uh, that he, you know, Mary finds him in the act of, of uh, exchange of this great dialogue. And uh, it's interesting, the, the scholars, the theologists said, well, he was 12. And uh, this is a very important time in a child of a Jewish boy, uh, during which you're prepared for the passage, uh, your rite of passage, which is known as Bar Mitzvah, uh, the great blessing uh, of becoming the adult uh, that understands the tradition. And from that moment, you considered a real man. So typically at 12, you study, and at 13, uh, you have your bar mitzvah. And before bar mitzvah, you are not required to tie the tefillin, but part of the learning is how to wrap it, what prayers to say. And uh, we see that, very interesting, look what Christ is doing. 
he shows you how to separate the thumb away from the rest of the fingers and to put the two fingers together and create the shin in his gesture. Hmm. And furthermore, you'll notice that his eyes compositionally take us down below. And we find this learned Jewish man with their Bible, <clears throat> with the Torah. And this particular man has a little piece of paper stuck onto his head, right? <clears throat> and it has been identified that uh, that text takes us to a reference in St. Matthew, where Matthew actually mentions the Jews wrapping the tefillin. And in this text, he mentions this critically because he said it's two ostentations. It's taking, two, because, you know, think about all the straps and boxes on the heads. They would have looked very strange to a non-Jewish person. And uh, Matthew writes, but all the works they do to be seen of men, they make broad their phylacteries, which is a tefillin, and enlarge the borders of the garments. So it's a bit critical, and it looks like the Christian Kabbalists take this we have to follow this tradition, but we can't make it visible. And we're going to make the uh, wrapping a tefillin invisible. So the straps and the box becomes invisible, but what we're left with is the position of the shin. Here, what's so amazing, it's supposed to be sh revealing Christ within your heart, but it's as if Christ himself in this moment understands his purpose right, through his coming of age, through this bar mitzvah, he's understanding. And in this very moment, look at how he's internalized the knowledge. He's got a little halo starting to glow around his head as a little boy. What do you think about that? It's very interesting. And uh, there were some comments about how there's a sense of humility on the face of Christ. Uh, but the rest of the men, there's some in the back that look skeptical or questioning. Uh, although this one down where he's looking at, there seems to be a connection that's being made. Exactly. I think they're showing a human uh, uh, gamut of emotions. Some are in disbelief. Some are skeptical. Some are learning and just going, oh, my goodness, because this man in the middle, look how he touches the hands of Christ. And he himself starts to try to form the, uh, maybe he's saying that's how you wrap the tefillin, right? And mm -hmm. maybe Christ saying you don't need to wrap it to make the gesture. So there's this exchange and debate, because remember, this is a debate. He's gone three days doing this right, right. <laughs> when Mary finds him. And this man seems to be the most uh, connected and kind of resolute with his hands folded. So now... Uh, I want to do a little game because we always have a little game uh, for our viewers. Where is the signature of Dura in this painting? Can you find it? We okay. give you a moment while Jeff hunts for it as well. Don't tell him if you see find the it. Door down below. Oh, I see it. I see it. <laughs> do we have any guesses? Perhaps they deserve the set of Rembrandt paints if they found it. I'm looking. I'm looking. Uh, Anna's scanning. So Anna's looking at all your comments and feeding okay, great. some of them to me while we're waiting here. But yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I got it. And it looks like a date too. Yes. Yes. And actually, while we're looking, you'll notice that hands are so important. The gestures are so important in this painting. And almost all of them point out to the shin, right? In one way or another, uh, you could see the middle two fingers being bound together. Just the square, that, that composition of the four hands together, that, that would be an interesting painting all by itself, just a really dynamic composition. Yeah. Um, we've got here, we've got bottom left of the book, in the hat, on the box, but the, the book is the winner. <laughs> the book is the winner. Here it is, Anna Domini or Albrecht Dürer has painted it in five days. He was so proud of this painting. He actually said painted in five days, right below his signature in year 1506. But what I want to attract your attention, why did he put it inside this book? This book symbolizes not the Christian Bible, it's the Torah. It is where the law comes for the wrapping of the tefillin. And what Dürer is saying, this is a bookmark. He says, I have read this text. I know it by heart. I understand this tradition. Look, even how that little pinky is inserted here. Uh, he is inserting himself into the Jewish context and the Jewish knowledge. Isn't that incredible? It is. It is. 
So I wanted to wrap up, as I promised you to keep it uh, to the hour, and of course we'll take some questions and comments, but I wanted to uh, give you one of the most powerful, one of the most beautiful quotes about the heart that comes from the greatest Kabbalistic text, one of the most important Jewish Kabbalistic text. Some of our viewers might have heard of the text Zohar, uh, which really literally means radiational light. Uh, imagine this inspiration of light coming coming towards you. Oops. Um, can you see it? Just, I see the word okay. the heart, but not okay, in the Great, yet. great. All right, here we go. Let me just move. The heart sees, the heart hears, the heart understands, and the heart knows, and in the heart of every wise-hearted, I have placed wisdom. And then in silence, I show you back to the, the most famous self-portrait of all times, Durer as Christ, placing the shin, revealing the heart that sees, hears, understand, knows, wise, and full of wisdom. And if you want to read more about this, the full text, I try to uh, make it as simple and understandable as possible to a wider uh, audience. But if you want all the references, uh, this text that uh, is on the cover is available on Amazon and you're welcome to read more of this discovery. And with that, let's take our comments and questions. Oh, thank you, uh, Jenya. That was fantastic as always. Love it, and everybody is uh, applauding. Uh, can get some more questions coming through. Um, lots of speculation over that self-portrait, isn't there? Over the years, I, you know, the some speculating that the gesture of the hand, he was making his own initials. Uh, I had read. Uh, I can't remember when, a long time ago. Um, was there a combination of hands making a shin? That's a question from Michael Fuller. Was there a combination of you of used, what? you showed earlier? Uh, well, this is a question from uh, Michael, and he says, Was the combination of hands making a shin also? Um, I'm not sure which image. Oh, like taking two hands and combining them. So, uh, remember, we saw the two hands coming together. So, um, if if I was orthodox and did this, um, I would be struck by the lighting. So, hope. Hopefully that won't happen right now. So that the combination is actually placing two. That's the priestly gesture. And that does make a shin. But what I was trying to say that these two hands are not the correct reference for this particular tradition. Um, and again, it makes sense. Why not? That's a forbidden gesture. You're not even supposed to look at it. But from the wrapping of the tefillin, that's a gesture that's uh, a public. You can look at it. So that's why it's respectful by the Christian Kabbalists to incorporate. It goes with one hand. Why not two hand by one hand? First of all, because it's wrapped on your left hand. When you put the tefillin that it attaches to your arm, you press it down, it's on your heart. So you're literally placing it on your heart. Great. Great. Well, and it makes sense too if you're, I mean, it would be very hard to do a two handed gesture in all those paintings, but it's much easier uh, to use the one hand and, and have that. Uh, so so funny. Yeah, my students try to make a portrait and not put any hands, and I always encourage them <laughs> to put a hand in there. So that's yeah. a funny practical, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's somebody saying now, just thinking about the meaning of other hand gestures and She's absolutely right. That's a great comment by Karen and a question. What is the history in those as well? It's, there's really so many, aren't there? There's so many different gestures that you can find in the history of art, hand gestures in particular. The and there, there. Is, there are books about it, but surprisingly, yeah. this one has escaped the correct interpretation. And why it spoke to me, because we always, uh, we always see um, a uh, kind of a friction between religions, frictions between traditions. And we don't expect, for instance, Nuremberg, which we know with the German Nazi trials, to be the place, the Nuremberg, the city of birth of Dürer, where the uh, Christian German artists are risking their life to support Jewish texts. 
right? So we have these two traditions coming together. And basically, if you're not Jewish or if you're not Christian, doesn't matter because what they're speaking about is an internal God that should be born within your heart. And that kind of spirituality really spoke to me. And I think that's why this gesture across the geography and time periods really even subconsciously perhaps spoke to you throughout times. Yes, yes, it is. I mean, I think it's of it's they're of their times too, and and that's something that we forget. We're looking at paintings out of out of time, if you will. So we have to place ourselves back in fifteen hundred and the beginning of the sixteenth century, and try to look at it in the eyes of an individual who'd be looking at it then. And some of these things, like you said, would be much more self evident to the viewer that might and have- dangerous at the same time because I now think- we can do anything and basically we can get away with it. But this can cost you freedom. You can get imprisoned if you are overtly over sympathizing with the Jewish tradition. You were called a Judaizer and you your freedom could taken away or it could cost you the life. So that's why these societies are meeting. And for instance, in Perkheimer, uh, Albrecht Durer's best friend's house secretly. Uh, and then it's a it's a network. Uh, across Europe that understand it, but it is a small network at the time. So the gesture is uh, perfect for invisible museum tours. It's largely invisible through time. Yes, yes, that's a great note. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to remember too, right? So so he was, Durer was really an artist who was able to synthesize the Northern European tradition with the Italian tradition. And the Northern European tradition at that time, the idea of disguise symbolism was so much at the heart of all their paintings. You listed several of them. I think of Van der Weyden especially, um, but uh, Van Eyck's another and, and, and the list goes on. But uh, that was something that was unique outside of the Italian tradition, which was much more gestural and emotional and emotive. Yes. It really synthesizes the two so well. And it's really exciting to and see. And the it. painting of the Christ undergoing his initiation, the bar mitzvah um, is made in Italy. So that's a very important point. It's like he's, he himself is conflating all these ideas, the northern and the southern, the, the way the symbology is working. And he is, of course, uh, talking to some, some of the great philosophers in Venice and in Rome. Oh, fantastic. It's a wonderful history. He's such a incredible character in the history of art and history in general uh, for that period. So, so my uh, hope is that when you open your books when you go on the internet and browse the great paintings when you finally go now we can go back to the real museums that this gesture will jump at you and you'll be amazed and how often it's referred to but not only you'll see it but you'll understand the context and you will feel connected to it's like a message in the bottle the artist was placing it to speak to your heart and you will receive it in your heart and the painting will mean a whole different world to you well, it's a wonderful gift that you're giving us all, Genya, is, is this ability to see these things that maybe we pass by without thinking. I know that we're all going to be doing that. <laughs> we're going to be pointing this out to all of our friends uh, every time we go in. Uh, Speaking of gifts, great. I think you have a gift for someone. I right? do. We do have a winner. We do have a winner. And the winner is Michael Fuller. So Michael, Ooh. we'll reach out to you. Uh, and uh, get your shipping information uh, and uh, uh, contact you about getting you a set of Rembrandt oil. So congratulations and thank you for joining us. And thank you everyone for joining us. This has been wonderful. Uh, And of course, Jenya, uh, thank you as always for a fabulous journey uh, in the invisible museum world. (laughs) Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time.